attended Gus's lecture last year in test on this subject and I don't mind telling you that if you do not leave here wanting to go out and change the world there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Gus the Breton. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone. I'm a little bit overwhelmed by the turnout here. Um, I've had a number of people ask me if I can record this as well. So for the first time ever, I'm trying to record this camera at the back. Two willing volunteers operating the camera. Thank you very much. Please try not to knock it over if you're next to it. Uh, I was asked if I would talk about medicinal plants. Last time I was here, I talked about medicinal plants. So I said, can I talk about something different? It's a little bit more serious. Um, I normally talk at a fairly light-hearted level. I don't want to get too heavy, but this is a bit of, bit of a topic that's quite close to my heart. So I'm, a, I'm gonna talk a little bit more seriously than I usually do. Um, of course, it won't be completely serious. Um, I am not talking about the indigenous plants that I believe could be used in our agricultural system. If you came to hear that, I'm really sorry. I will talk about that on another occasion. I have done a lot of videos on that subject and I've also written, but not found the money to publish a book on it, um, indigenous plants that are suitable as crops for smallholder agriculture. What I'm talking about today is just at a higher level it's basically why. why. Why do I think indigenous plants should be a fundamental central part of our agricultural system? I hope that's what you came here to hear me say. So I'm going to start by introducing you to a very typical rural Zimbabwean woman. Her name is Sikai Shati. My talk more. She comes from Chibui, Chimani Mani. Oh, Chibui is actually in Chipinge, Chipinge, Chimani, Mani. She's got five kids. Uh, she's very typical rural Zimbabwean. She grows a bit of maize, some millet as uh, food crops and vegetables. But these are the interesting figures. She's got half a hectare of maize. She gets 380 kilos out of it, which is not a lot, but that's what the average smallholder farmer gets. She gets about $115 in cash from that. Her input costs, which are fertilizer, fertilizer, seed, and maybe even a little bit of pesticide and weed killer, cost her $80. You know what fertilizer is, it's expensive. Her land prep is $20. She has to hire someone, she can't do it all on her own, so she has to hire someone to help her with preparing the land. And then she works 18 days over a four or five month period, um, weeding and all that stuff. Value her labor, let's say at $5 a day, that's a kind of typical agricultural wage, uh, 18 days, that's, you can see, that's uh, nearly 100 bucks. So that's what it costs her to produce $115 worth of maize. It's like well over 200 bucks. So she's losing money on it. And I think if you ask every single smallholder farmer in the country about the economics of their maize production, they'll tell you the same thing. I tell people all the time this, and they just they blank out. Like they don't want to hear it, but, but it's the truth. But she also has uh, another sideline. She collects baobab. And in her area, there's a lot of it. And these are the economics of baobab collection. So she sells 800 kilos of fruit in a year. And she sells them in 50 kilo bags worth 120 bucks. She doesn't have any input cost because there's no seed and there's no fertilizer and there's no pesticide and there's no herbicide. She doesn't have to prepare the land. She doesn't even buy the bags that she collects because the company that buys from her gives her the bags. All she does is put in the labor. And the way that works is she goes out in the morning uh, usually when she's doing other things, she takes a bag with her, she goes and visits her trees, she picks up whatever fruit's fallen. She doesn't have to climb the tree for it, she just picks up whatever's there, puts it in the bag, does her other stuff, she's collecting firewood or whatever, takes it back. So that's her, that's her labor, that's the sum total of labor. Six days over four months. 30 bucks of labor 
for 120 bucks of revenue. Now that makes sense. I think anyone, we can all agree, that does make sense. So that's just to set the scene. That's fundamentally, I've just explained everything. I may as well go now, that's the end of the presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed it, thank you. <laughs> so, I'm gonna be a little bit statistically oriented. I'm not gonna go into it in detail because it gets boring. Um, but I'm just gonna review stuff which, of course, most of you know. Uh, but it's helpful to see it in black and white. So if you look at our agricultural system in Zimbabwe at the moment, and let's ignore anything that has happened uh, at a political level, let's just look at it as agriculture, as a business that most rural people in this country survive on. What are the main issues affecting it? Well, the first one, of course, is climate change. And we're all very familiar with these headlines of drought and uh, more drought. And of course, the statistics bear, uh, I mean, it's not, it's not imaginary. This is absolutely real. Um, this is when you divide the country up um, in, into regions and analyze over the last 20 years the likelihood of drought. So um, this is uh, risk of mild drought and the darker colors are higher, higher risk. So mild drought moderate drought, severe drought, and extreme drought. And you can see that significant chunks of the country are at risk every year, every year of extreme or severe drought. Basically all of that. And I don't think anyone is gonna question that. These are every year from 1990 to 2019. That's where we had drought. That's 91, 92. We all remember that. Most of us are old enough to remember that. Uh, my most grim uh, memory from 91 was going to the fence line that there used to be at Chapinda Pools along the boundary of Gonorajo and Matibi 2. And seeing behind the fence in Gonorajo the grass this high. And outside in Matibi 2 there was not a blade of grass. And along that fence line were just dozens and dozens and dozens of dead cows. Because of course they were trying to get into the fence and they couldn't. Uh, it wasn't a pretty sight. I'm sure you've all got your own memories from that particular year. So that's the first one. The second problem that we got is biodiversity loss. And I think um, anyone from My Trees here, associated with My Trees, organization that's doing great work uh, around tobacco deforestation, we are uh, all very familiar with these sad sights and, and I'm sure it's been a conversation around probably almost every single one of your dinner table at one point within the last couple of years. Uh, we actually have the highest rate of deforestation in Southern Africa at the moment in Zimbabwe, um, which is quite sad. Environmental degradation, of course, they're very much related. This is a familiar site as well. This is eroding soils and you all know what I'm talking about, it's exacerbated, of course, by the plague of gold panning, um, and that's really uh, compounding it and turning it into a major ecological disaster. So those three things are all serious impacts on our agricultural system, and then related is what they call the double burden of malnutrition. So what's the double burden of malnutrition? Well, it's when you're malnourished and obese at the same time. And believe it or not, we have that problem in Zimbabwe. South Africa, it's a huge problem, uh, literally. And in Zimbabwe, it's becoming that way. Why is that? Well, very simply, because 100 years ago, that's what most people's diet looked like. And today, that's what most people's diet looked like. And that's pure, refined carbohydrate. And I don't think I need to tell you what that does. And of course, people who can move away from that, like people that live in the cities, then go for that, which is actually, I think, even worse than the previous one. By the way, fascinating statistic in uh, a wonderful book called The Omnivore's Dilemma, which I highly recommend. Michael Pollan, any of you ever get a chance to read it? He analyzed chicken McNuggets in the US and found that 38 out of the 42 ingredients in chicken McNugget come from maize. 
which is a pretty horrifying statistic. Food consumption patterns. This is three years, 2018, 2019, 2020. I won't bother to explain it, but just to say that people's diets got progressively worse over those years. And we are eating probably worse in Zimbabwe now than we've ever, ever eaten. I think I can genuinely say that. So agriculture is the victim of climate change, but it is also a leading, if not the leading cause of climate change. And what we're doing now, agriculturally in this country, in my opinion, and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, is not sustainable because we're borrowing from the future and the future is not going to lend to us forever. There are some bits of good news. You've probably all heard of from Woodza, conservation agriculture, I think it was called originally Farming God's Way, um, but it's a system of zero tillage conservation agriculture that is really effective and uh, addresses a lot of the problems that I mentioned and is being rolled out at a national policy level. I don't know how successfully. We do, which is really exciting, have a new policy for us to promote small grain. So previously, if you wanted to sell um, to GMB, you had to grow maize. That was what they were going to buy. But now you can also sell millet to them, which is amazing. Uh, and sorghum, of course. And we've got quite a significant movement towards uh, traditional foods, which is very encouraging. When I started um, a long time ago, I worked really hard to create the first ever indigenous plant product to go into a supermarket in Zimbabwe, I think other than probably a grain. And it was, uh, I was so proud of it. It was masao jam. So you know what masao is? Yeah. So I have masao jam. It didn't taste great. Masao's got a bit of a kind of rotten smell, makes excellent al alcohol, of course, you probably all know. Uh, anyway, I made this jam and I got it on shelf and I was chuffed. And there was an article in which uh, a, um, a journalist called Lupi Mshayakara, I think was her name, it's quite a prominent journalist at the time since deceased. She wrote and she said, We in Zimbabwe are so poor that you can now buy masala jam in this <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, <laughs> not getting it at all. Now, National Foods, biggest food company in the country, have just commissioned their new traditional grains mill, which is incredibly exciting. Dairy Board last year launched an indigenous food product using baobab. It's a cascade, it's a fruit milk, and it's become overnight their top selling cascade product. Better than the strawberry one, the banana one, the chocolate one, and the white one. People buy it because they think it's healthy. It's got a ton of sugar in it, so I don't know exactly how healthy it is. But, but of course, old habits do die hard. We have a five-year national development strategy at the moment that is supposedly guiding us. It involves devaluing currency once every three months. We're really good at it. And uh, in their food and security and nutrition security part of the strategy, their prime objective, one of their prime objectives is to increase maize production. So we've started to make change, but we haven't really got that far. Three million tons a year, that's what they want. So, okay, indigenous plants. So where do indigenous plants fit in? Where do they fit in currently? Well, these are uh, a survey of smallholder crops. Um, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but uh, there are quite a number on the right there of indigenous plants that smallholders do habitually grow. Uh, you could also arguably add the sweet potatoes there. This is a survey, the National Survey Zimvac Vulnerability Survey. Um, and it's done every year in Zim, amazingly. And they interview smallholder farmers about what they've grown. And on the left, 84%, 80% say that they've grown maize. Now, when you consider where communal farmers live, 
and you think that probably only about 30% of communal areas are suitable for maize, but 80% of them have grown maize, it does make me start to wonder. And then the next one, my next most popular is groundnuts. Then we get some indigenous cow cowpeas, sorghum, groundnuts, which of course is Nemo beans, Dambara. And then a bit of pearl millet, finger millet. And it's the same with cereals, the blues, the maize, the others are the indigenous ones, you can see. So here's to me this astonishing paradox about this crop that we grow, particularly maize. Doesn't come from here, it comes from Mexico. Not suited to our climate. It doesn't do well when it doesn't rain. And as we know, it doesn't rain quite a lot in Zimbabwe. <laughs> It also doesn't like the pests that we have here because it hasn't grown up with them. We've got awesome pests in Zim. They can eat anything. And they love maize and the other crops. Oh, and it doesn't do that well unless you stuff a ton of fertilizer on it. And you need a lot, and it's expensive, and fertilizers use a lot of energy to produce. Oh, then you need to buy the seed, of course, because you need an improved variety, because there's no indigenous variety. So you get an improved variety, which is sold to you by a seed company, most of which is owned by a big foreign multinational, which we have to pay. So in order for us to eat the maize, which, which is a loss-making crop for most smallholders, we have to pay a company overseas, somehow, somehow, I don't know how the money goes, but it gets there, to buy the seed. And then we do it again next year and the year after. It seems to me barking mad. It also means we're trying to compete on the world market with this commodity that everyone else grows and most of them grow better than us. That of course is a wheat field in the Ukraine, but well, we do grow wheat here, but how can we possibly compete? By the way, that's where wheat comes from, as we now have discovered. Oh, and as if that wasn't enough, these exotic crops are making us sick. You know, the thing about maize, maize has some nutrients, it does have nutrients, I'm not going to totally diss maize, I mean it's the staple for a lot of people in the world, but it has some anti-nutrients, and in the places where maize naturally occurs, they know about those anti-nutrients, and they know how to prepare the maize in such a way that they kill those anti-nutrients. We don't know that, and we don't do it. The way they do it in maize producing areas is through fermentation. So you've heard of tapioca. Tapioca is the main way in Mexico that maize is consumed and you ferment the maize. In the process you kill the anti-nutrient compounds. We don't do that. So we consume those anti-nutrient compounds which build up in our body and eventually become serious health problems. And we're just starting to see that in Zen now. <laughs> that's a true story it's affecting our cognitive ability and that is actually from a Zimbabwean newspaper and I think that's from the BBC so it's not just me saying it these exotic crops that we grow they also are really bad in, for the planet in terms of climate change because they require so much inputs and the inputs take so much energy to produce it's very expensive to make fertilizer and actually it's one of the leading drivers of climate change one of the biggest emitters globally from of climate change is fertilizer manufacturer factor it's preposterous okay so I'm gonna stop dissing uh, exotic crops now I, I know many of you some of you have been involved in farming them so I'm sorry for all the bad <laughs> things I've said about them I'm just trying to make the point and contrast them with indigenous plants so let's go on to what we have in this country we've got 6,000 species here Every single one of those species is a product of an extraordinary biological process called evolution. That process means that that plant has evolved in exactly that place to be perfectly suited to exactly the climatic conditions that it experiences. That means it's meant to be there. That's why it's there. If it wasn't meant to be there, it wouldn't be there. 
Those species died a long time ago. The ones that we see now are the ones that have survived. Thousands, tens of thousands, and millions of years. About a fifth of these have traditionally been commercially used or, or, or have traditional uses. But less than 1% of them are currently used. 1% means 60. Less than 60 species are being commercially used in Zimbabwe at the moment. Okay, this is a slide from the last time I was here. A uh, reminder, amazing man, Michael Gelfand. Uh, he sat with uh, a few others, Steve Marvey, Rob Drummond, and they interviewed, in the early 80s, they interviewed traditional healers about medicinal plants that they used. And they interviewed over 200 healers, and they identified over 500 species of medicinal plants. Think of the knowledge. Think of the incredible time it's taken to build up that knowledge, the trial and error. The number of people who must have died along the way just <laughs> figuring out that knowledge. <laughs> yeah, apparently that one doesn't work. <laughs> Another beautiful book, if you can find it. Um, apparently, I think in Gwery, you can still get copies of it. Um, Food Plants of Zimbabwe, uh, Margaret Treadgold. 200 different species she talks about, and that's just skimming the surface. So we've got 200 species of edible plant in Zimbabwe and 80% of the edible plant that we eat is maize. Like one, which doesn't come from Zimbabwe. So this is how it is in our country. We've got 16 million people. 60% of them live in rural areas. The majority live in rural areas, which is unusual, by the way, in the world, in most parts of the world. Most people live in urban areas. We haven't got that yet. Most people in Zimbabwe still live in rural areas. Most of the people that live in rural areas are poor. Quite a number of them are very poor. And, no surprise, the poorest ones also live in the driest areas. The driest areas being the most drought prone areas. And in those areas, over 80% of the people are poor. 62% of our country is dry land. So the majority of people live in rural areas. 60% of our rural areas are dry land and people there are very poor. That's from Bikita, uh, but it's just emblematic of most of rural Zimbabwe. I could tell you that's from anywhere. It's from Matoko, it's from Matubili land, wherever. I mean, that's what rural Zimbabwe looks like. It's beautiful. But it's kind of shit when you're living there and planting maize every year and it doesn't grow. <coughs> but here's the irony. 150 years ago, people lived in those areas and they were fine. Why? Because they didn't clear native vegetation and grow some stupid crop that had come in from elsewhere. They just helped themselves to what was around them and they knew it really well. 500 species of medicinal plant is a lot of knowledge. So they knew it and they just went out seasonally and of course it was tough in the dry season but right now it's bare bad trees are dripping with fruit. So it's not like there's nothing. Even throughout the year nature has always provided. And whenever there was a drought, well, things got a little bit tougher but these trees still produce fruit. So I ask myself and continue to ask and I've always asked myself it's like it seems so obvious that we we're, we're banging our head against a brick wall trying to grow these plants that aren't really meant to grow here and we've got so much here that's naturally evolved why why are we not focusing on that that's a big question I don't necessarily know the answer but here's what I think is probably the answer well, I think it starts at a policy level um, where early colonial era, you've got to feed everyone, let's do it as simply as possible, let's grow maize and a few cash crops and let's forget all about the rest. In fact, not only let's forget about the rest, let's actually make it difficult for people. In fact, let's even make it illegal. 
So, like, what do most people in rural Zimbabwe do every afternoon of the year, historically, traditionally? They get drunk. It's good. It's true. It's the same all over the world. How do they do that? They make it a traditional brew. So guess what? It's illegal. <coughs> so all these different plants. Uh, do you know how many plants in Zimbabwe can be used to make traditional brews? It's an astonishing number. <laughs> I'm very interested in this topic. <laughs> Also, medicinal plants, by the way, were outlawed. Use of medicinal plants in Zimbabwe is illegal under the Suppression of Witchcraft Act. Can you believe? You can buy all kinds of Chinese medicines here, but it's illegal to use a Zimbabwean traditional medicinal herb. Of course, the policy blindness doesn't take account of the reality on the ground, which is that people still consume many of these things. These are all indigenous fruits that are being consumed across the country. Matamba, Matoe, Majanji, Mengeni, Masau, Ni. I think you all know them and are familiar with them. And traditional indigenous vegetables. So people do use them. They are consumed. But has one cent of government money ever been used to promote any of these? No. Of course not. Not at all. So... Why do people not spend more time doing it? Well, because they know that ultimately a cash crop is about what? Cash. And there's no market for these things. If I grow maize, the GMB comes along and pretends to pay me and then maybe pays me at some point. <laughs> and the GMB was set up by the government. The government initially used to say, right, you have to sell your maize to us and we'll buy it. But the thing is, as much maize as you can grow, we will buy it. And the same with the cotton, and the same with the dairy, and the tobacco, and that's all gone on like that. So it's like it's a no-brainer. If you're a farmer, am I going to grow something that I might possibly sell to my neighbor, or am I going to grow something that a big company will come along and definitely buy and probably pay me for? Of course, you're going to take the latter option. So markets don't exist for these indigenous plants. It's true, they don't. But just because they don't doesn't mean they can't. This is a picture of all the bareback products that were on the shelf in 2010. <laughs> okay. It's actually a picture of Bon Marche in 2010. But anyway, let's pretend. That's how many products at that time there were. These are the products that are today on the market that come from bear <laughs> and these and 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 I could show you there are hundreds of products hundreds of new bear products every year coming onto the market why because someone sat down and said let's make this a success sorry that's a lot of text in one slide you don't have to read it let me just summarize it so here's the way I see it Indigenous plants are potentially a winner for us. They evolved locally. They suit our climate. They give us as producers a competitive advantage as much. We can never compete with Ukraine for wheat. But we will hammer Ukraine when it comes to bearbab every year. <laughs> guaranteed. They don't require all these inputs. They don't have huge barriers to entry. The very poorest of the poor can get involved in harvesting bearbap. There's no costs. You don't need anything. They give us an advantage. They create local value addition opportunities. They're also more biodiversity friendly. In areas, and by the way, this is a topic that's going to become very hot, and it is already very hot, human-wildlife conflict. In areas where you've got elephants and you try and grow maize, it's a disaster because the maze is just like come come help yourself and then everyone's lost and then ultimately who loses is the elephants of course it's not the farmer ultimately it's the elephant because if the elephant's going to keep coming so why grow maize that the elephants love year after year bearbab well there's no conflict you can harvest the bearbab the elephants aren't going to touch you it's fine so there's also a big human-wildlife conflict benefit from these indigenous plants. So, if 
if you are still with me, and I know it's really hot and I'm sorry, then hopefully you agree with me that it does make sense for us to use a lot more indigenous plants in our production system than we currently do. So then the question is, okay, we agree that, now what? What do we actually have to do to make it happen? Well, here's an example of a product to which this has happened, and that's rooibos tea. 40 years ago, you went into anywhere in the world and asked them what rooibos tea was. No one had ever heard of it. Now it's everywhere. 20,000 tons a year of rooibos tea are produced. It's a major cash crop for South Africa. It's a significant export. There are thousands of people in the supply chain for rooibos. All of these different products. Why? Because they said, let's make this a success. Rebus doesn't occur in any other country except South Africa. So it's like an obvious one. And they sat down, they created a Rebus Tea Council, a bit like the Tobacco Research Board, and they said, right, we're going to do all we can to promote Rebus. We're going to commission research into the health benefits. We're going to figure out better ways to grow it, better ways to harvest it, better ways to process it. We're going to do marketing stuff. And now it's huge. This is examples of all the health research facts that they've produced about it. Uh, they even got it protected under the geographical uh, indicators, which means, you know, you can't grow Bordeaux. You can't call sparkling wine champagne unless it comes from champagne. You can't call it robots unless it comes from South Africa. They actually protect it. So even if someone did take it somewhere else, they could never do it. Very quick example from Zimbabwe. Resurrection, Fandi Chimuka. Mufa means you die, the Chimuka means you then come back to life. I'm sure many of you know this plant, probably all of you know it. It grows all over rocky gomos in the country. It's a quite remarkable plant. How this thing survives and goes, I don't know. It's kind of a miracle. But it's also an important medicinal plant. And at some point, I said, uh, or a group of us in Zimbabwe said, couldn't we make this into our rooibos tea? <coughs> so we started and we had to address the rules, the laws, like the laws on <laughs> harvesting it, the laws on selling it. You can't sell something unless you can prove it's not going to kill you. So I know that uh, resurrection tea is not going to kill you because it's been traditionally used, but I can't prove it. And if I'm going to talk to a regulator, I need to be able to prove it. So we've had to do a lot of research to prove that it's not toxic and it's actually good for you. We've had to develop new products. Uh, we've had to develop, identify companies in Zimbabwe that are interested in, in working with um, resurrection. Uh, also work on the sustainability side, cultivation trials. It's a long process and so we haven't had nearly enough money to do it. So we've we haven't done it to the scale that Rooibos, I mean, Rooibos was promoted by the South African government. <coughs> and we have not had one cent of Zimbabwe <coughs> government support. But nevertheless, we have started to get there. That's the actually Rooibos and the Resurrection Tea, you probably know it. Um, and now look at all the other Resurrection products that are on sale. These are all in Zimbabwe. But there are now resurrection products on sale in the UK, in <coughs> Germany, and it's starting to happen. I'm especially proud of this product. <laughs> Anyone who knows me well will probably know why, but uh, this is brewed in Victoria Falls and it does have a very strong resurrection flavor and it's a fantastic product. The resurrection gin is in the pipeline. <laughs> okay, resurrection is a small one, but it's a Zimbabwe specific one. I just wanted to show you how it could happen if we were to all put our energy together and say, right, let's do this. That's what we've managed to do so far. This is one I've also been involved in at a uh, Africa wide level. This is Baobab and uh, I'm Many of you are probably familiar with the story now. <coughs> Baobab's been used all across Africa. Probably one of the oldest plants that was traditionally consumed in Africa. In fact, we found Baobab seeds next to 30,000 year old 
hominid remains in South Africa. So we know 30,000 years ago, our ancestors ate it. Probably their ancestors ate it as well. It's been around for millions of years. It hasn't really changed very much in that time. And probably we've always ate it, eaten it. <coughs> My wife is very serious about English grammar. <laughs> and get things wrong. She, I, I saw her tutting then. <laughs> First uh, imports um, to Europe, first recorded in the 1500s, but the first time it was officially imported was in the early 2000s. And the key moment in making baobab to what it is now, which is a very well-known product around the world. It is now growing demand for baobab. There are hundreds of baobab producers across Africa. And the key moment was when we set up an association to try to promote it, called Fighter Trade Africa, early 2000s. Um, it was a trade association. We had members from eight countries across Africa, and we said, let's make Baobab a success. So we did all the work, which was the big job was getting it approved in the EU, because in the European Union, they have a law that <laughs> says, just because you people in Africa eat it doesn't mean that it's going to be okay for us. <laughs> so you have to prove to us that it's okay. And you, what you have to do is you have to put it through toxicological trials. They cost thousands and tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands of dollars. It cost us half a million US dollars to prove that something we knew was safe was in fact safe. Anyway, we did it and it created a stir because um, no one from Africa had ever put an African ingredient before through this approval process. It was the very first time and I don't think the Europeans really thought we were capable of it and they were a bit surprised. So, bunch of Africans bringing their product. <coughs> but it made a lot of noise, and um, we then took it to trade shows. We got articles written about it. Lots of this, is, this was our brief to an advertising company in the UK. We gave an advertising company about $30,000 a year to promote Baobab. Um, a lot of stuff that went on. Then we created an association just to promote Baobab, which is called the African Baobab Alliance. Um, I'm not going to go through what it does, but just to show you that as an alliance, our objectives are to get Baobab to the point where there are 1 million rural women across Africa benefiting from it, 10 million hectares of woodland, uh, Baobab woodland being managed, 300 million tons of carbon sequestered, and a billion dollars of trade a year. That's our objective. We're not there yet, but that's where we hope to go with Baobab. That's the scale that I think Baobab is capable of achieving. And in Zimbabwe, when we started in 2012, uh, the total demand for Baobab was probably about uh, maybe four or five tons of Baobab fruit that were basically sold on the side of the road and taken to Mbari Msika. That was it. We're now on a about probably two and a half thousand tons of baobab fruit that are being processed and sold a year. The total potential production in Zimbabwe is about twelve and a half thousand tons. So we're still a fraction of where we can go. That's without planting anything. So, well done all of you guys for staying with me this long. I'm just now going to talk about in very specific detail what I think we need to do to get our agricultural system to take more cognizance of indigenous plants and to incorporate them. <coughs> and the two things I've learned in my experience have been that you need to do it systematically. You can't just imagine it's going to happen. You actually have to do something about it. I guess that's the same with everything. Uh, and creating some sort of organization, I think, is the best way to do that. These are Baobab sales when we started, and that's when we created an organization to promote it. And, and look at, I mean, it's the same with anything. Uh, you know, I don't know if there's a Blueberry Producers Association here, but I'm pretty sure there's something like that. And, you know, all, any commodity, if it's going to get taken forward, it needs collaborative effort from everyone doesn't just happen by itself and 
what do the sector support organizations do? They help with the regulations, they help with the scientific validation, because if you're gonna convince consumers to buy it, they've gotta know why. What's so special about this, let's say, babe, What's why, why should I buy it? There's lots of stuff on the supermarket shelf. What convinced me I should buy Baobab? Well, that's science. That's what science does. There are lots of scientists that are sitting around with not much to do, twiddling their thumbs, looking for something useful to do. This is a wonderfully useful thing to do. You just need to get them to connect the dots. Raising market awareness, addressing problems of quality. We have big issues with quality when when people produce substandard quality product, consumers don't like it and then they won't buy it. If you buy some horrible baobab, you're not likely to buy it again. It's the first time you've ever bought it and it's full of weevils, that's probably the last time you're ever gonna buy it. So we gotta get the quality right and get the supply right. So, coming to the end guys, well done. I think we need to create an organization at a national level to do this. In Namibia, they have an indigenous plant task team chaired by the Ministry of Agriculture whose sole job is to promote commercial development of indigenous plants. Not a lot of maize growing in Namibia, so. <laughs> this is from Colombia. Colombia is one of the most advanced countries in terms of using their own biodiversity. It is a huge thing there. And this is Bio Comercio sustain Sostenible, which means sustainable biotrade. Biotrade is the word that's used for trade in these indigenous plant products. And it's a massive government supported initiative there. Very, very, very successful. Peru do the same. Peru is the source of potatoes, by the way. You probably know that. Um, they've invested in a lot uh, in developing all their indigenous potato varieties and many, many, many other things. Uh, I just I won't go through it. At a policy level, at the moment, there's still no recognition in Zimbabwe of the opportunities from indigenous plants. Nobody in the government has ever talked about it. South Africa, they have a bioeconomy strategy. It's actually a strategic direction. They are actually, the government is funding research into indigenous plants as crops in South Africa. And that's exactly the biodiversity economy it's run, run jointly by the department of industry and the department of environmental affairs in namibia they're doing the same thing they have a bioeconomy strategy um, in fact all these countries in green around the world have already woken up to this and some of them are doing it on a really big scale china obviously humongous China has whole universities that all they do is research indigenous plants for their commercial use. So what I'm saying to you here isn't actually that new. It's maybe new as to us, but it's not new in the rest of the world. So we're behind the curve. And, and that's sad because in many ways in Zimbabwe, we've often been ahead of the curve and on a lot of levels, particularly our community-based wildlife management policies the so-called so campfire program, whose offices are somewhere there. We were world leaders, and we've, we've been world leaders way, punching way above our weight on many levels, but this is an area where we're behind. We're not, we're not irredeemably behind. I believe it's very possible for Zimbabwe to become a leader very quickly in this field globally, if we all pull together. But someone at the top has to recognize it. And of course, we have to start by actually marketing indigenous plants and consuming them. Because if you don't consume them, there's no incentive for a farmer to grow them or to harvest them. When I hear people tell me why they don't eat millet porridge, it makes me weep. There's maize porridge, there's millet porridge. This one is terribly, terribly bad for you. This one's really good for you. This one has a huge environmental cost. This one has no environmental cost. Why do you eat this one? Because it's white and that one's brown. <laughs> You're kidding me. Seriously. Seriously. <coughs> but we've got to get over that. We have to get over that. <coughs> I have been promoting a concept called heritage foods. Um, 
Mm. I'm trying to get Zimbabweans to be proud of our traditional foods. Because nobody, no one's great grandmother had diabetes in this country. I promise you, diabetes was never heard of a hundred years ago. Everyone in this country was strong, fit, and healthy. And now look at us. When we had COVID, the ones with diabetes were the ones that were hit hardest. We all know that. Everyone knows that. And we need to we need to rebrand those traditional indigenous food plants and make them sexy. This is what they do in Senegal. In Senegal, they have magazines devoted to indigenous foods. And if you're a tourist and you go to Senegal, the first thing everyone will give you is a traditional Senegalese dish. I own a restaurant in Victoria Falls, and I cannot persuade anyone in my restaurant to produce sides of there. Even it's the simplest, like traditional food, because they say, ah, oh, tourists don't want that. And it's sad, you know, I mean, it, it is honestly sad. Okay, sorry, that was a bit of a contradiction to say it's sad, yeah. but you know what I mean. <laughs> this is another example from Senegal. Just showing you, there's whole, in uh, London, there is a food movement of Afro-fusion food. It's huge. Um, and there are chefs that are getting into it, and it's really exciting. And I have tried here to do that, and, and we are still at the very beginning. South Africa's biggest tourist export <laughs> comes from an indigenous plant. And you've all drunk it. I guarantee everyone, of, everyone here has had it at one point or another. And I mean, it's simple. You know, it's not hard to make Amarula. It's got a great story. People love it. Starbucks selling rooibos latte. Not like it can't happen. I'm not saying it's nice. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the point is that someone's taken, made the effort to try and market it and get consumers to buy it. This is our number one skincare product in Zimbabwe. It's called petroleum jelly. <laughs> This comes from an indigenous plant. It's the wild melon, Tsamu melon. Mm -hmm. It grows all over Matabili land. You see it all over. And it makes a beautiful natural oil. And it's really good for you. Petroleum jelly, by the way, turns out isn't really that good for you. I don't know why that would be, but... <laughs> but yet, can we persuade Zimbabwean consumers to go and buy this? They want petroleum jelly. Vaseline, bring it on. But it just requires a bit of a mind flip. And someone just has to do the work. You know, during the Second World War in Britain, they had to completely change their diets. They couldn't get any imported products. They could only have local products because Britain's an island and none of these food ingredients that people used to eat. So they had to just eat what they could locally produce. The government had a department that was the Department of National whatever it was, I don't know what it was called, but their job was to convince people to eat stuff that they didn't want to eat. And they did. They succeeded, and people started eating this, and guess what? At the end of the Second World War, the British population was the healthiest it had ever been, because they'd been eating these things. It, it, it can happen if someone tries seriously to do it. And then, of course, research. This is what uh, most excites me, is actually doing systematic research into our indigenous plants. It, we have done it in Zimbabwe in the past, not a lot, but right now there's almost nothing going on. Again, Namibia, the National Botanical Research Institute has an entire department that is specifically geared towards developing commercial uses from indigenous plants. South African National Biodiversity Institute does exactly the same thing. Again, really, really, really big. Any of you that have been into our herbarium, uh, I know there are one or two of you who practically live there, um, will know that there's not much in that uh, regard going on in Zimbabwe, very sadly. New York Botanical Garden has an entire institute of economic botany. A lot of the research into 
hallucinogenic mind altering uh, narcotics of the 1960s came from these guys <laughs> by the way uh, mostly from the Amazon this is the Lith Lithuanian National Laboratory of Economic Botany I'm just trying to show you that it's not it's not just a few countries it's happening all over the world this is actually Botswana the Okavango Research Institute they have a major focus on indigenous foods there so in Zimbabwe we also have the regulatory hurdles that I mentioned the biggest one is the medicines control authority so the medicines control authority licensed drugs if you want to sell a drug in Zimbabwe it has to be approved by the medicines control authority there are a number of herbal medicines that are approved by them none of them come from Zimbabwe mm -hmm. none of them echinacea peppermint they're all approved but not a single Zimbabwean medicinal plant that is approved by the Medicines Control Authority. The Standards Association. Those are the novel foods, foods approvals. These are all processes, these are all hurdles to developing indigenous plants, but they're all hurdles that can be overcome. We just have to do it. And then of course we gotta support businesses because it's hard. I own more than one business in this field and it's really tough I came here in a very modest car not a big fancy Toyota Land Cruiser <laughs> South Africa they support their businesses using indigenous plants they they take groups of them to trade shows every year they have a whole systematic program that is the Peruvian national stand at the world's biggest organic show and they have about 40 Peruvian companies that they bring every year to show their products, really trying to promote it. This is a fund uh, set up, actually funded by Norway in Latin America to promote uh, businesses based on indigenous plants. 54 million Norwegian krona, a starter fund, all of that. In Zimbabwe, ha, ha, ha. There's no chance. We've got a young Baobab entrepreneur right here who just said to me, just as he was, uh, before I started, he said, the biggest problem is getting funding. Let me tell you about my ex No, I'm not going to. <laughs> my experiences with banks in Zimbabwe. Um, it's just, it's laughable. Even in some very poor countries in West Africa, there's been significant... Uh, development. So Burkina Faso is of course home to the share butter. Share is one of the biggest indigenous plant value chains in Africa. It comes from all over West Africa. There are about 4 million rural women involved in the share butter industry. 4 million rural women. So this is the end guys. Thank you well done for getting here. These are my conclusions. Indigenous plants have a huge role to play, I think, and I hope I've convinced you of that. But it's not going to happen by itself. It's not just an organic process. Someone needs to make it happen. <coughs> I don't think there's ever been a better time for it because things have changed in the world. Now, Zimbabweans are looking at indigenous products. If, if, if um, Dairy Board had launched a Baobab flavored cascade 20 years ago, they would have been laughed out of the market. Their competitors would have been, have you seen those guys at Dairy Board? They're gonna tank, because no one's gonna buy it. But now it's their top selling product, and now everyone else is rushing to follow them. So the change is happening, and the time is right. Globally, everyone's interested in the story everyone's interested in the fact that it's natural the fact that it's environmentally friendly so now is the right time we've never had that time before but ultimately it's going to be up to us to do it we're the ones that are going to have to make it happen no one else there's no santa claus that's going to come in and wave the magic wand and change it all we are the ones that have to do that so all of you guys who've been here today and uh taken an hour out half of your time to listen to me i really really appreciate that 
you all part of that change. And even if you do one thing, buy a pint of resurrection beer. <laughs> be a great starting point. So thank you very much, guys. Um, there's a lot of information on our website, bioinnovation.org. Uh, you can also find me on social media. I'm sure we can get a link to that. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. May I offer you a, a jar of homegrown Mokovizi uh, honey? You certainly can. I can, can. guarantee thank it you. does not have any mealy meal in it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about bear, bear pollen. <laughs> but, um, ladies and gentlemen, I thoroughly enjoyed that lecture. Um, as I said, if you don't go away wanting to change the world after hearing this, um, there must be something wrong. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.